so we're going to uh, discuss briefly three different topics today. Uh, we're going to speak about Python modules, and we're going to speak about how to work with VCFIs, which relate to uh, Michal's discussions this morning of, of uh, human uh, genetics. And then we're going to discuss also about multivariate analysis, which is a continuation of our topic uh, from the last two lessons of statistics. So let's dive right into it and start speaking about modules in Python. So, and this is also related to this uh, topic of object-oriented programming, which I spoke a little bit about. We had the short uh, lesson discussing this topic, and we had a few uh, student presentations regarding this topic. And I think our motivation here is, is very similar in, in many ways. So, so first off, I want, it's important for us that uh, you, you understand what's going on under the hood when uh, you work with Python, and whether it's uh, what objects are and what classes are and what happens uh, when you import a package. So we don't want you to think that any of that is like dark magic, that uh, something uh, strange is going on. It's actually very straightforward and simple, and I think modules are just the same way. And like with object-oriented programming, we're not going to discuss it very thoroughly and like really give you everything you need in order to, to keep it like uh, a daily practice for you, but I hope to give you sufficient introduction such that, such that if you find it interesting, you can then pursue it on your own. And I think it is, uh, again, something that could be quite useful in, in uh, maintaining and organizing your code in a better way. And I hope you will be convinced that it's something that uh, might be worth uh, your time. Okay, so like I said, the motivation we have here is organizing our code. And actually up until now when we uh, looked at the example and when you do research, most of the time we just work in an interactive way, okay? So uh, we just type in a bunch of code, we execute it and we get the results. And we don't think too much about uh, having something that could be used for uh, general use. Uh, I did encourage you to use the Jupyter Notebook, which I think uh, actually strikes a very nice balance. So on the one hand, it's very interactive, so you can just type your code and you get the result right away. Uh, but on the other hand, you don't lose a, a anything and everything is kept into your notebook and it, it does allow you uh, reproducible research. Uh, so it is reproducible, but it's not really uh, something you can very conveniently reuse. So if, for example, you uh, you write a piece of code that you are very happy with and very proud of and you uh, dedicated a lot of efforts to make it very uh, nice to use. For example, a very nice function or a very nice class uh, that could be used in many places. If you then want to use it in a different project or in the different uh, Jupyter notebook, uh, we didn't really show you any way you can do it without just copy pasting your code, which is not a good idea. We said many times that code duplication is, is not a bad practice for uh, many good reasons. So if you actually write some generic code that you actually want to reuse, whether it's by yourself or by others, uh, you may want to, to seriously consider it to just uh, write down a module, which will give you some Python package that you can then import and use whenever you want. And that can be a very nice way to work. <coughs> now modules are in fact incredibly simple. They're nothing more than uh, standard Python files. So those files with the py suffix that you just write Python code within it, every, every time you see it, it could be uh, treated as a module. There is nothing else you need to do in order to make a Python file into a module. Once it's within a Python file, you can just uh, import the file and everything that is written within, in, within this file, whether it's some variables or classes or functions or whatever it is, everything will just be imported into your local environment and you can then start working with it. The only practical problem that you need to, to overcome is that Python needs to know where to search uh, this file. So every time that you import a package, uh, Python looks for a file with the name of the package. So if you import random, it looks for random.py file. And in order for it to succeed, su succeed in finding this file, it has to know where to look for it. And that's what we call the Python path. Uh, and there are different ways in which you can, uh, you can either change the Python path or just put a file in somewhere that is already within the path. So the best option, of course, is just to install the module into some standard location. And there is a bunch of uh, 
standard locations in Python, the Python nodes to look there in advance. For example, most of the kind of third party uh, packages that you install will go into a folder that is called the side packages. Uh, so if you use some standard installation routine, it will automatically go there and Python will know how to find it. So that's nice once you have a, a module that is ready to use and working. Uh, but during the development of the module, you probably don't want to put it there because it's like uh, something more permanent. And then you might need to use all kind of temporary hacks to, to, to modify the Python path so Python can find it. So for example, there is the Python path uh, environment variable. Uh, in either Linux or Windows, you can change uh, the variable and uh, put your directory within it, and then Python will know how to find it. Or you can, within the Python program itself, you can change uh, the syspath variable. And I will show you an example how we can do it. Uh, and finally, if you are within the module itself, there is something that is called a relative import. Again, I will discuss it uh, more later. So I think the best way to illustrate it would just be through an example, and you're really going to see that it's really, really uh, simple. So for the sake of this example, I wrote a, a, a file which is called uh, genome reader py, which I put, uh, I put in C downloads. You can download it from uh, the Moodle if you want. And if I open it with some editor, say Notepad++, uh, you can see that again, there is nothing special about this file. It's just a Python file with Python code, just having all the imports that I need, uh, defining some function, defining some class. Uh, that's the same class that I used as, as an example when we spoke about object-oriented programming. So we saw like some practical example that we can define this chromosome reader class that allows you to efficiently uh, read from a FASTA file describing a chromosome. Okay, so now we have this file and let's see how we can use it uh, within our notebook. Okay, so I open the modules notebook. And, okay, so first thing, uh, let's see what is this uh, syspath thing. So I import the sys module and within it I inspect the path variable and you can see I get a list of strings of different folders that, uh, that are used by Python to look for any, any module that I try to import. So every time that I try to import a module, what Python does is simply going through all of these uh, directories, one after the other, and looking to find those files there. And you can see it looks for many uh, places which are specific to Anaconda because we use uh, the Anaconda environment. And specifically, you can see that we have the side packages. Uh, like we said, that many of the packages that we installed, for example, NumPy, Pandas, uh, BioPython, all of those things will uh, probably go there. Now, if I want, I, I put my uh, module in C downloads. So if I want Python to be able to find it, I will simply add it to this list, very simple. So I'll just append it to the list and now print it. And you can see that uh, on top of all the standards, uh, paths, we also have C downloads. And now I can just import it like basically any, any other module. So I can just, from Genome Reader, import something within it, for example, uh, the function that I wrote. And then it, it works, uh, as simple as, as that. Nothing really uh, more special to it. And now I can basically use it. So again, I, uh, I downloaded this uh, file in advance and I I removed the compression, so I created this uh, chromosome 11 FASTA file. And now I can simply use the read sec function and it works. Uh, like uh, in the pre previous lesson where we just uh, wrote it within uh, the Jupyter Notebook. And like everything else, modules are just Python objects. So, um, so you can see that I can import the module and then can then assign it if I want to a different variables. Uh, not that there is a good way to do that, but if I want, I can do it. And now module one is yet another reference to the exact same module and everything that the module has, uh, the variable has because it's essentially the same object. And if I really want to, there is also another way in which I can import modules. I can import it 
I'm not using uh, directly the syntax, but I can uh, basically just give it a string. So I can take the name of the module as a string and then use the special underscore underscore import underscore underscore function, which gets a string and looks for a module within with this name. And again, it's actually the same module. So if I import the same module multiple times, it, it will not really reread the module every time. Again, it will just give me another reference to the same object. And you can see that module one is the same as module two. It's the exact same object. It's the same reference, no difference. Any questions? Okay, good, yeah, that's basically it. Uh, that's all, in essence, we, we need to know about uh, modules. Now, a few uh, other uh, somewhat related uh, topics that I wanted to discuss. Uh, two functions, which again, not very useful, but sometimes used, are the exact and eval functions. Uh, it's not a good idea to use them generally, but in some edge cases, it, it can be uh, useful. So the exact function is some kind of function that you can give it a string that has some Python code within this string as a string. And then it just executes the string as if it were a Python code that you just wrote into your notebook. So you can see that I execute this A equals 55 code, and then I actually uh, get this variable created. And a similar function is the eval function, which simply evaluates an expression. So it just takes some Python expression, evaluates it, and gives me back the result. So in this case, uh, it gives me the square root of A, which is uh, 30, 125. Now the reason I mention it uh, when discussing modules is sometimes people use it to execute whole files. So for example, one thing you can do instead of importing a module, you can actually read it as a file, just give the full path of the Python file, just read it using the fread function, and then execute everything within it. And if I do that, you can now see that the chromosome reader is not really part, part of a genome reader module, it's actually part of the main module. So, so now it's as if I just copy pasted everything within this file into my notebook like this and then just executed it. So it gives me the exact same effects, uh, but without, without actually uh, copy pasting it into the, the, the notebook. Now, of course, it's not a good idea. That's, that's not like uh, the right way to work with, uh, with code that you want to reuse. The right way is to use modules. Uh, but sometimes it can be some kind of useful under limited conditions. So it could be useful, for example, if you want to develop something and you don't want to go to the trouble of uh, working with modules while developing it. So uh, temporarily, you can just use this trick to, to, to load it as if it were part of your uh, notebook. And only after you finish, you can wrap it up and turn it into an actual uh, module. Uh, but again, it's... it's uh, very often you, you won't really want to do that. Um, but yeah, I think that's pretty much it. it. So questions? Okay, so a few more topics I wanted to say uh, with respect to, to modules. Uh, one thing again, it, this relates to the last thing I said. Uh, when you actually develop a module, sometimes you, you want to debug it, you want to change it while you still work with it. And not every time uh, you want to reset your notebook and start everything from scratch. You, for example, if you already loaded a lot of data and done a lot of processing, then it could be very time consuming every time to restart the kernel and starting everything from scratch. Uh, but sometimes you do want to actually uh, change your module. And like I said, if you actually try to import the module again, just to run the import statement, it actually won't do anything. It won't reread uh, the module. It will just notice that you tried to import something that is already imported. And it will basically do nothing. Uh, it will just give you the same reference to the same module. Um, so so there, is a, there isn't a very convenient way to go around this. This is uh, somewhat annoying when you try to develop something. Uh, like I said, there are some hacks which you can try. So one thing, of course, if it's not too expensive, just restart the kernel. I think it's the safest approach, just to, to restart everything. Uh, but if you cannot do that, you might want to consider, for example, uh, doing the kind of trick I showed you at the end to just 
uh, execute the whole file and just forget that it's actually a module. Another option that, again, has its own troubles, but most of the time will work for you, is to use the reload function from the import lib uh, module that you can just give it a module and it tries to reload it uh, and, and will give you a reference to the new module. Now, it works most of the time, but it has its own troubles. Uh, the main problem is that it won't actually update any reference to the module. So if you imported some module from multiple different places, and I don't know, maybe some modules have references to, to some other modules or some sub-modules, then it won't actually make sure to update any reference, and you will need to manually do that. And this can create even some inconsistency in your code. So this could be somewhat uh, troublesome. Another thing I wanted to mention is the issue of modules with multiple files. So if you, have, if you want to write down a very large module that has a lot of code and a lot of uh, features, uh, sometimes it's a good idea to split it across different files because you don't want a single file with uh, 10,000 lines of code. It would be very difficult to navigate and to orient yourself uh, within it. So it can be a good idea to, to spread it across different modules. And one thing you can do is you can create sub-modules. So you can take, for example, you can see here, you can have my module, which has some sub-modules. It has uh, sub-module 1, sub-module 2, and sub-module 3, which is itself a directory that has its own sub-modules. And create a, actually any kind of directory structure that you want. So it can go as deep as you want. And for example, if you have something like that, you will be able to do something like from my module, the main one, uh, dot submodule one, uh, this file imports some function that is written within this file. Or from my module, import some function too. So you can actually import something directly from uh, the main module. Now you might ask, ask yourself, okay, where is this actually written? It's a directory, it's not a file, it doesn't have any code within it. And the answer is that for that you have the underscore underscore init underscore underscore uh, py files that they actually relate to the directory itself. So my module, everything that you try to download directly from my module, it will actually go to this file and try to, to take it from there. And you can also do something like for my module, submodule three, import submodule four. Okay, so it's, it's quite intuitive. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, good point. So, so actually, you, you're, if you if you use this kind of structure, you're actually forced to create those files. So if you do not have an init file, then Python will yell at you and say uh, you must have them. So even if you leave them empty, empty, you need to have them. Now, of course, if you want something to be imported directly from uh, the main module, you have to write it within the init file. Okay, you won't be able to do something like from my module import some function two if you don't have some reference to some function two within this init file because that's where it's going to look for. Uh, sometimes what you see people doing, and again, it, it's, it's quite convenient and, and common to do that, people actually write down the function within a more specific file, like for example, submodule one, and then they import it into the init module using some relative imports, so they import something from some module one and put it within init. They don't actually write the function within the init files, they just import it from another submodule. And after you do that, then it becomes accessible to anyone using the module because you already have a reference to it within the init file. Okay? Okay, and then finally you also have this uh, option of relative imports. So if you actually need to import something, if you write a large module that has some different submodules, and you want to import something that is written within one submodule into a different submodule, then you probably want to use a relative import. Uh, you don't want to use the whole name of the module. Uh, so you can do something like uh, from dot import d, and that actually tells Python that you do a relative import. Okay, so if for example your code is in the a, b, c submodule, and you do from dot import d, then it will go to a, b, d. Okay, because c and d are like sibling uh, modules within the same uh, 
within the same parent uh, module B, and so they can treat each other using this uh, relative syntax. Or if you do from two times dot import E, then it will actually go to the parent to A and then go to something within it. So it will take A, E. Or you can even do something like from uh, two dot F import G, and then again, it will go to A because you have two dots and then to F and then to G. Okay, so you have this uh, quite flexible kind of syntax uh, that you can use. <coughs> Like, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to dive too deep into it, but there is uh, this issue of cyclic imports uh, that it can sometimes cause troubles. Um, again, I, I won't dive into it, but uh, if, you, if you happen to, to develop modules, just remember that typically it's not a good idea to have cy cyclic modules. So if you have uh, two submodules, say A and B, uh, it's not a good idea that A will import things from B and B will import things from A. Usually it indicates a bad design and it can also uh, cause some technical troubles. So if you have two submodules which are so intertwined that you cannot really divorce them and, and decouple them, then it might be an indication that you might want to merge them simply into one module. Uh, yeah, and and the final thing, uh, which you may notice sometimes people use is this underscore underscore name underscore underscore ver variable uh, which simply simply gives with any kind of co code it will give you a reference to uh, the module simply the module name it's a string that will give you the name of the module of the current code where it's executed so if for example you write it within I don't know the genome reader module then if you look up for name it will just write to you genome reader just the name of the module. And if you're not within the module, if you're within the main scope, for example, within the Jupyter notebook, it will simply say underscore, underscore, main, underscore, underscore. And you sometimes see people you actually use it. It's quite a convention for people to write something like if name equals main. And what it basically does, it just makes sure that the code will run only if that's like the main uh, code only if you d execute it directly and it will not run if you just import it into a different uh, module Now it's not very useful. I, I, I think the main reason people actually use it is Just to indicate that this is like the main uh, part of the code So if, I think it's some kind of leftover from other programming languages Which had to explicitly define a main function which in Python we actually don't have to do but it's like a way to To, to pull attention to this piece of code and saying like that's the main thing that is going on Again, not very useful in my opinion, but you see many people uh, use it when they actually want to write uh, scripts that can be executed. For example, if they write a command line interface using the arg parse or something of that nature. Okay, so that's everything I had to say about modules for now. Um, now again, this wasn't really a very uh, thorough discussion of the topic, just I hope uh, some introduction and segue into it if at some point you decide to uh, to pursue it further. I, I will say that if you are serious about turning your code into some package, uh, you might then well, uh, may want to consider to use additional technologies that will help you to wrap it to something that people can easily install. For example, there is the setup tools. Very often you will see a setup py file, uh, which is some kind of file that you can use to install uh, packages and it's very nice and very easy and you have very nice tutorials if you want to use it So it basically just lets you wrap something into a package. It's very simple. You just need to write some um, Some annotations that give some description about this kind of uh, Package and then everyone can just install it and it goes directly to some standard location and they can start using your package and it even lets you very easily to upload upload your module into uh, the PyPy repository uh, which means that uh, people can then use just pip install to install your package, which is very nice. Okay, yeah. How to share a code with others? Yeah, exactly. So I put you, I put here. You see a link to to GitHub, which I think is like uh, the main standard for code sharing. So. 
that's like a huge uh, repository of free open source code. So every time that people want to write some open source proje project, 99% of the time they will use it, GitHub and put it there. Okay, so you want to share with, with two people? You can also create, so if you want to collaborate with some people on, on writing code, that, so that's your question, you want to collaborate with some people and write some piece of code together, I'd still recommend you to use the Git technology, which is a, a general technology, not just in GitHub, a general technology for using some kind of, of code sharing and also like version controlling and stuff like that, which is very useful. So you can actually uh, do some uh, very convenient uh, synchronization between the code that you're writing and the code that other people are writing and nothing gets lost or every time that you commit something it's well maintained and, and kept in order and it's a very useful technology uh, but then if you don't want to I mean if you don't mind if it doesn't have any kind of copyright or proprietary issues why not just use it in GitHub I mean it doesn't actually force you to to, to support others I mean and if you just use in-house I mean I guess no one will use it if you don't uh, advertise it if you are concerned about uh, people, I don't know, stealing your ideas or you have some intellectual property issues, then you might want to use a private repository, which again, uh, GitHub, in GitHub I think you will have to pay money to get a private repository, but there are other services that will give you repositories. In the Hebrew University, for example, you can even get it from uh, the system guys. So just tell them that you need a repository and they will give you a repository within uh, the Huji network. Yeah. Yeah, and, and like we, we, we saw today, uh, if you actually want other researchers to use your package, I mean, most of them are probably not very advanced uh, Python programmers, so it might be better to just provide a command line interface, which is again something uh, we saw today, how you can do it uh, quite easily. And yeah, I think uh, that's it for this topic. Any final questions? Okay. So let's speak about uh, VCF files. <coughs> okay, so a few words first, but generally how, how, how genetic data is stored. Uh, so like Michal mentioned, what we have at the beginning is raw reads, so raw NGS data, uh, which in its most basic format could be stored, for example, it's very commonly in the fast, fast queue format, uh, which is basically just uh, a bunch of reads with some additional data like scores and stuff like that. Uh, you can also turn it into other formats, like for example the BAM format, after align aligning it and mapping it into some reference genome. So that already entails uh, more information. And yeah, but so, so you get all the data, but it's very, very uh, storage consuming. So each kind of sample can amount to really tens of gigabytes just to get all the reads. And most of it is really very redundant. So you get the same kind of nucleotides repeated over and over, over again, a very inefficient formats. And most of it just matches the reference genome. So you could spare it. So if you actually want to work with variation, most people will not use uh, the fastq format as kind of the final uh, data that they analyze. They will turn it into something that is easier to work with and probably will want to do what is called uh, variant calling. So they will actually want to compare those kind of uh, raw reads and see how they compare it to the reference genome and just keep the differences. Uh, which are called variants, like Michal uh, explained today. So that's already much easier to work with uh, because you only have the distinct elements. So it's many orders of magnitude smaller than all of those tens of gigabytes that you have in your raw data. And you can actually try to then analyze it and see like, for example, how variants affect different things, how they correlate with different traits and all kinds of other stuff. Uh, but it, there is, of course, the downside that what you get then is not actually uh, some uh, divine truth. You Basically, what you get is the decision of some algorithms. I will say, as a side note, by the way, that the, the fast Q files are not divine truth either. So we could have 
uh, mistakes here too, but uh, the more you go down the line of more pipeline processing programs, uh, the more you get away from the raw data and the more it, it, becomes, it comes to reflect uh, the decisions of different algorithms and how they decide um, to, to call the variance. So it, it might be in the end some decision that the algorithm makes whether to consider something as a variant or say, no, it's just you know, a sequencing error or something like that. Okay, now once you get those variants, which could be either accurate or not, uh, the most common format that people use is called a VCF, uh, which stands for Variant Call Format. So it's a very common, uh, very simple kind of uh, format, which is also textual, so it's very nice to actually look at it and you can right away see what's going on. Uh, by the way, which of you have got to look at VCF files? Okay, so only a handful. Um, okay, but, but it is very easy. We're going to see it today. It's, it's, it's a very simple kind of, of format. Now, the, like I said, the concept is very simple, just listing a bunch of, of, of variants, like explaining what those variants are, what, what turns into what, so what do you have in the reference and what is different from the reference and which people have it. So very simple, uh, but the actual details are quite complex. So there are just all kinds of, of small uh, decisions and details that if you like really want to go uh, to understand everything, it becomes quite complex. So for example, the specification file of the current version, which is 4.3, is 35 pages long and it's very like dense and very small font and <laughs> not very nice to read, but you can read it if you want. And to add even more complexity, not everybody uses the same kind of of format, so for example, the 1000 genome project that Michal mentioned, they use a slightly different specification that actually deviates from like the official standards. Does yeah. The format include any quality control? Will yeah. It? Yeah. yeah, I will show it. Yeah. Questions? Okay. So, so what what do we actually have within VCF files? So the main part, which is called the body is simply tab separated rows. So it's very much like CSV or TSV file. You can actually read it with pandas if you want. Um, <laughs> that each of them, each row represents a distinct variant. And you will have at least eight columns which are mandatory in all VCA files. So you will have the chromosome of the variant, its exact position on this chromosome. Of course, with respect to some specific uh, version of the reference genome. Uh, it might have an ID, uh, which is the kind of RS IDs uh, that you saw, and the reference and alternative sequences. Uh, so what turns into what, and then you have some quality score, and maybe some filters, which are additional quality uh, checking, and as many additional information fields as you want. Here, like there is like uh, there is a lot of flexibility in what you can actually put here. So. In some files, for example, if you open the exact files, you, can, you will see tons of information within these info fields. And then after those eight mandatory columns, you will have additional columns which provide the actual genotype of each sample or individual. So if you, for example, within the 1000 genome project that you have like 2,500 individuals, you will have 2,500 columns that each column simply uh, represents a different person and you will see its uh, genotype for each variant. Okay, I uh, won't get into that. I already explained what everything is. Um, okay, we'll just say that very common things that, for example, you can find within the info fields uh, that will include something like AC and AF, which stands for allele count or allele frequency of each of the alternative alleles. Okay, so listed in the same order. So, for example, you will know whether it's uh, a variant that appears in 1% or 0.1% of the alleles and so on. And then you will also have the AN, which is the total number of alleles uh, that will were called for each kind of uh, variants. Okay, now on top of this body part, you will also have headers which begin with two hash symbols and they can describe additional kind of properties. 
Uh, for example, very important, uh, the version of the VCA format, and even more important, the version of the reference genome. So I think that's like maybe the first thing you want to check out when you open a VCA file. If it's a human population, you want to see whether it's uh, version 37 or 38, because this will probably affect uh, the entire downstream analysis that you want uh, to carry out. I can see the creation dates, whether the data is phased. Uh, we'll speak about it in a minute. And the description of the different info fields. So one nice thing about VCF is that everything is actually described. So every field that you have, you will have a full description within the header headers. So most of the time you won't have to go to like the official documentation. Everything is just within the file itself. You just need to read it and it's, you know, it's not very elaborate, but it does give you some description of what's going on and what everything uh, means. Okay, let's look at a concrete example and see how it's structured. So here you have an actual VCF file, which I took. And for convenience, I, sp I split it into the headers and the actual body, but of course, in reality, it's just uh, one pile of text. So just uh, the body begins right after the headers. And you can see all the headers here. So for example, you can see that the phasing is partial. Uh, what this means is, okay, so I will say now a few words about phasing. So what is phasing? So li like Michal mentioned, in reality, uh, variants are not inherited individually. So what you inherit from your parents are not individual variants, you actually inherit uh, larger chunks due to how recombination works between generations. And this results what is known as haplotypes, which are um, some combination of variants which tend to be inherited together. And in some cases, it could be important to know whether if you, for example, have two variants, you may want to know whether they are part of the same haplotype, whether you have them on the same copy of the same chromosome within your genome, or maybe you have them on two different copies. So one was inherited from your mother, one was inherited from your father, and they're on different, um, different copies of your genome. It could be relevant in some cases. For example, if it's something regulatory, it could be important. And that is called phasing. So most of the time in most VCA files, you don't have phasing. So you just see individual variants and you actually have no idea how they actually relate, relate to one another. So they could be on the same. I mean, if it, it's only relevant if you have uh, heterozygous uh, variants. So of course, if you have the two copies of the same, whether it's the reference or the alternative, it doesn't matter. But if you have two heterozygous variants, Typically, you don't know whether they are on the same copy or different copies of your genome. Uh, but sometimes in some VCA files, uh, you do have phasing, and that's called, could be either full or partial phasing. And then like the order in which the alleles are listed, and I will get to it in a moment, that actually matters in those kind of files. OK. And you can also see within the headers, you can see all kind of info explanation and the description of each kind of info field and all the different formats that you have. OK, so let's start looking at the actual variants. So you see that the first variant is within chromosome 2 on position uh, 4370. And it actually has an RSID, means it's not a too rare variant, probably. And that's a variant which simply is it's a simple uh, single nucleotide variant. It's replaced. It replaces the G nucleotide with an A nucleotide within this position. So some people will have the reference G allele and some people will have the alternative A allele. You also, also have some quality metrics which say uh, what's the quality of this kind of uh, variant calling and some filters which I won't get into and all the kind of info fields which we uh, described. And then importantly you have the format which says uh, in what format the actual uh, genotypes that you then have are listed. Okay, so like we said, the genotypes are simply additional columns, one for each sample. So you have a column for sample one, and then for sample two, and sample three, and so on. So each one could have some name. Uh, in this case, just sample something. And then for each sample, we can see its exact genotype with respect to this variant. And the way it's actually listed is very simple. You have, uh, it's simply integers. So zero means the reference allele, 
OK, so you can see that this individual, it has two zero uh, alleles, meaning it has twice the reference G allele. So this is a homozygous reference with two Gs in this case. Then a second sample, you can see it has one and zero. So one refers to the alternative allele. So this is actually a heterozygous sample. It has one copy of the alternative A and one copy of the reference G. And the third one, it has two ones, meaning twice the alternative A. So this is a homozygous alternative uh, genotype. OK, so that's the first thing that you see within each symbol. That's the GD. It's called the GD. And you can also see the explanation within the headers. You can see the GD uh, description says genotype. And then you have some additional fields, which Again, they're more used like for kind of quality control and if you want to see like the actual scoring. Uh, so for example, you have the P, which is, um, which is the depth. So you can actually see how many reads you had and if it's too few, then this might be not very uh, indicative in this case. And all kind of scores and probabilities. And I won't get into it, but it gives you quite a lot of information of how much you can actually trust to those kinds of callings. Yeah. OK, excellent question. So what's the difference between the vertical line to the diagonal line, uh, the slash that we have here? That's exactly relates to the kind of uh, phasing which we mentioned. <laughs> now, I'm not 100% sure which is which. I think that the vertical line is the phased genotypes, and uh, the diagonal line is the unphased. So when you actually have a vertical line, this means that the order of the two alleles is actually important. So having one zero is not the same as having zero one. Okay, so for example, here you can see that sample two, in the first variant it has one zero, and the second one it has zero one. So in both of these var variants, it's a heterozygous variant, but it has the reference on different copy of the genome. So one of them was inherited from the father, one from the mother, but we, we know for sure, because it's actually phased, that uh, it was inherited from different parents. It's not the same copy of the genome. Um, yeah. I mean, assuming, of course, that, uh, I mean, OK, I, I would say it differently. I mean, it could, it could be that uh, they were uh, inherited from the same parent. Uh, but, but we know that the two variants are on different copies of the genome. OK, and that's the crucial part. And now you will also notice that uh, some variants not, have not only zero and one, they also have two. And that's what we have when we get variants that have multiple alternative uh, alleles. So again, this, this actually varies between different implementations. So some callers will not allow variants with more than two alternative alleles. Some will allow it. So for example, here you can have it. So you can see a variant that actually has three different options. So it could be the reference A, or it could be G or T. And then you just have a counting. So one will be the first one, G, and two will be T. Yeah. Uh, questions? OK. Uh, some limitations of, of VCF that are worth uh, keeping in mind when we work with it. First of all, we, um, we don't have copy number variations, which is uh, a big problem typically when we do kind of variant calling. Uh, so it's both a different color and probably a different format that it's then stored. So VCF will give you actual variants, but if you have entire regions that were deleted and then you have less copies or some regions that were duplicated and you have a higher copy number variation, it won't be actually listed within VCF. Also, one thing which I um, referred to is this issue of haplotype and phasing. So in reality, our genome is better seen as some kind of combination of haplotypes and not individual variants, or yeah, individual variants. And you can partially uh, allow this kind of more complex interpretation to be supported if you, you have some uh, phasing, like we saw, but it won't be a complete solution. And that, that's a, a much more general problem. And, and some people even oppose the whole idea of reference genome and think that it's uh, misleading to, to consider some kind of hypothetical 
reference genome, then just to consider kind of variation from this uh, reference. So there are all kinds of uh, other options that people have suggested throughout the years. For example, some people advocate for looking at the genome actually as some kind of graph of haplotypes. So instead of looking at differences from the reference genome, just look at each individual as some kind of combination of haplotypes which are connected uh, between each other. So theoretically, I think it's a more accurate uh, way of looking at the genome, uh, but it hasn't really gained uh, much widespread use. I think mostly because it's too complicated, so it's very difficult to worry, and people have already gotten used to working with uh, reference genomes. So, so yeah, not, not too many people use it, but it is some kind of suggestion that is out there, and it should definitely be kept in mind that uh, Although it's a very nice way to work with genetic data, it's not the most biologically accurate way of thinking about things. And finally, we have the issue of somatic mutations, which are much more complex than uh, germline variants. So most kind of colors simply assume germline variants, and actually the entire format of VCF was designed with germline variants in mind. So we think about kind of variants as high, either uh, homozygous or heterozygous or to be a reference or alternative. But uh, if we deal with somatic mutations, for example, in cancer, things are much more complex. So for example, you can have a variant which is a subclonal mutation that appears only in 3% of the cells. And that's not, it's not entirely sure how you would think about it. It's not like, it's not a heterozygous variant. It could be a homozygous variant as far as you know, but it only appears in a small fraction of the cells. And actually, if you gave it to a regular caller that works for germline variant, it wouldn't be a, even able to detect it because they like assume that uh, a variant can either appear like 0% uh, of the time or 100% of the time or 50% of the time. So if it's standard caller, we we'll see something that happens in, I don't know, 40%, uh, it will just assume that it's probably a heterozygous and that's like, you know, measurements uh, inaccuracy and you know it's something that should be like 50% so it will try to run it. Um, but that's of course not the case in somatic mutations but you can basically have any percentage and, and again much more complex and VCF is not the right format to work with uh, this kind of data. Okay so how we can actually work with uh, VCF files when we do programming? Uh, so there are many kind of efficient open source implementation which are written mostly in C and uh, C++. Uh, this can mostly provide you with a rich set of command line tools. So for example, a very popular choice is VCF, VCFlib, which will allow you to do all kinds of manipulations on VCF files, uh, but it won't give you a programmatic interface in Python. If you work in Python and you want to analyze the data in Python, uh, you have the PyVCF module, which is very nice and very simple to use, but is incredibly slow. Um, like very, very slow to the extent that I think it's really impractical to use in any uh, kind of large scale analysis. So if, if you were to analyze the entire 1000 genome project or the entire exact project, I think it wouldn't be really practical to use PyVCF. Uh, so I actually had a dilemma whether to teach you to work with it or not, because I think it's not too practical in, in many real life uses. But again, I decided to, to show it to you after all, just so you can get a sense of how to use it. Uh, even though you will encounter a uh, scalability problem if you try to use it uh, on really large data. I will say, by the way, that parsing it by hand is not too difficult either. So uh, you can write your own kind of code or use panels or things like that. Again, it's a very simple format. And in many cases, it, I think it's just the simplest approach, uh, at least uh, until someone writes proper uh, parser. <coughs> 